Well, welcome everyone. My name is Luz Colon Rodriguez and I'm the Assistant Director of Outreach and Programming in the Office of Multicultural Affairs here at Creighton University. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming and introducing our keynote for Women's History Month today. Um, Major General Marsha Anderson is an amazing person and is with numerous distinctions and only some of which I'm going to touch upon today. She is the first African-American woman to achieve the rank of Major General in the United States Army in September of 2011 when she was recognized for the work she was doing in the Human Resources Command as Deputy Commanding General in the Army Reserves. In her role as Major General, she serves as the bridge between operational and tactical aspects of the Army. Her military awards and decorations are numerous and include the Legion of Merit, Brutus Service Medal with three oak leaf clusters, Army Commendation Medal, Army Achievement Medal, Parachutist Medal, and Physical Fitness Badge. <laughs> Major General Anderson has served as a senior advisor to the Chief Army Reserve on policies and programs for the USAR, in, including force structure, congressional budget and appropriations process, development of manpower and personnel policies, as well as the Department of the Army and the Department of Defense Matters since October of 2011. As a civilian, General Anderson serves as the clerk for the United States Bankruptcy Court in the Western District of Wisconsin. She is a graduate of Creighton University at Rutgers Law School. And so on behalf of Creighton University's Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Liebman Center for Women, please give a warm Blue Jay welcome to Major General Anderson. I'm a little bit taller than you, so I'll move this up a little bit. But thank you, Luz, for that, for that introduction. And, and thank you, everyone, for welcoming me back to Creighton. Um, it's been a great day, and I, I've really enjoyed myself. I've had a chance to meet a lot of your fellow students. I had a chance to spend some time with the students at Central High School, which was just a, a treasure and a delight for me. And so this is just going to kind of cap everything off. I hope I will, in the next few minutes, be able to share some, some of my thoughts, some history with you about um, strong women, as you saw in the slideshow that I had running before. Um, I, I tried to provide images of, of really strong women who I admire. And, um, and there are some women there who are oldies but goodies, like Dorothy Hamill and, and, and people that, but also new, newer people like S uh, Serena Williams. But um, it, again, it's my pleasure to be here, and I, I hope I can um, maybe leave you with a few things you didn't know when you came. And I hope uh, during the question and answer period that I'll be able to, to kind of fill in any of the blanks that I leave after you've had a, listen, a chance to listen to some of the things I want to share. Well, this day in history, in 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published. On this day in history, in 1854, the Republican Party was founded. On this day in history, in 1915, Britain and Russia signed a secret agreement to divide the future spoils of war, which coincidentally included areas of the Black Sea and current-day Crimea. On this day in history, in 1934, Mildred Babe Didrikson took the mound for the Philadelphia Athletics and pitched one inning of exhibition baseball against the Brooklyn Dodgers. And by the way, she only allowed one walk and no hits. On this day in history, in 1965, President Johnson sent a telegram to Governor George Wallace of Alabama in which he notified the governor he was going to send federal troops to keep order and supervise a planned civil rights march from Selma to Montgomery. Also on this day in history, in 1982, Joan Jett topped the pop charts with, I love rock and roll. And finally, this week in history, on March 22, 1972, the Equal Rights Amendment was passed by Congress. It said, and I quote, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex, end quote. Hawaii was the first state to ratify what would have been the 27th Amendment to the Constitution. However, it failed to achieve ratification by the required 38 states and never became the law of the land. And I often wonder what things would have been like today if it had been ratified. I think as the proceeding illustrates, women's history is inextricably intertwined with American history. 
And throughout our history, women have been leaders in indirect and in very direct ways. So tonight, I want to share some of that history with you, how it has shaped and affected me personally, and I hope to leave you, especially those of you who will be the next generation of leaders, with something to think about as you prepare yourselves for what I believe will be a journey that takes us as a country to a whole new level. And for those of us who are already participants and leaders, I hope I will leave you with an idea of what is coming and suggestions on how you can help to prepare and enable the next generation. As you may know, Women's History Month had its origins in International Women's Day, which began in 1911. And our nation celebrates Women's History Month in March, recognizing the victories, struggles, and stories of the women who have made our country what it is today. This month had very modest beginnings. A school district in California decided in 1978 to observe Women's History Week. In 1979, during a women's conference at Sarah Lawrence College, the participants decided jointly to work and initiate similar celebrations nationwide. And as a result of those efforts, eventually Congress and presidents since Jimmy Carter have supported the public recognition of women's achievements and contributions. So this month, one of the lessons that we are necessarily reminded of as we study women's struggles for equality is that even in America, Freedom and justice have never come easily. As part of a centuries-old and ever-evolving movement, countless women have put their shoulder to the wheel of progress. These are activists who gathered at Seneca Falls in 1848 and gave expression to a righteous cause. Trailblazers who defied convention and shattered glass ceilings, and the countless millions who personally claimed control of their own bodies, their voices, and their lives. Together, they've pushed the nation toward equality, willingly or not as well as liberation and acceptance of women's rights. Not only the, the, the ability to choose and shape their own destinies, but also to help us shape the economic, social, and political futures of this country. The women we recognize this evening, or I am talking about, are emblematic of this history and tradition. So if you will indulge me, I will take the next few minutes to share some of that history so that I can illustrate the lessons in character, courage, and commitment that their efforts have imparted to me. Against social convention and often legal restraints, women have created a legacy that expands the frontiers of the possible for generations to come. They've demonstrated their character, courage, and commitment, and leadership skills as soldiers, mothers, educators, institution builders, leaders in business, labor, political, the religious, and in their personal communities, and also as workers and CEOs. Their lives and their work inspire girls and women to achieve their full potential and also encourage boys and men to respect the diversity and depth of women's experience. The collective contribution of women to our country is extensive and too much for me to go into tonight, so I'm going to leave you with a little bit, just a little bit. And a few of these examples are going to be from the private as well as the public sector, and I hope they're going to whet your appetite to learn even more. Women have served in the military since 1775, both uniformed and civilian, and with distinction in every war since then that our nation has fought. And they've participated both formally and informally. From the early years of the Revolutionary War, women have stepped forward to serve alongside men for the cause of freedom. They tended the sick, they mended clothes, they served as spies, and they even armed cannons on the battlefield. So the following are a few examples that I believe demonstrate the determination to defy convention and the social constraints of their day. For example, in 1782, at 22 years of age, Deborah Sampson became the first woman known to enlist as a soldier in the American Army. She put on male clothing, adopted the name Robert Shirtliff, and enlisted in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment. She was wounded in her left thigh during the Battle of Terrytown in New York, and to keep her secret safe, she treated herself. Eighty years later, during the Civil War, an African-American woman, Cathay Williams, enlisted as William Cathay and served with the 38th Infantry Regiment as a Buffalo soldier. However, she was later denied a disability pension because she did not fit the definition of a veteran. Also during the Civil War, Dr. Mary Walker, who was depicted in the slideshow earlier, served as assistant surgeon 
with General Burnside's Union forces. She was captured by the Confederates in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and imprisoned in Richmond, Virginia as a spy. Eventually, she was released and returned to serve as a hospital surgeon at a women's prisoner of war hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. After the war, President Andrew Johnson awarded her the Medal of Honor, and Dr. Walker is the only woman in our history to ever, ever have been awarded this highest honor. American women have been, also been leaders on many other fronts as explorers, entrepreneurs, civic leaders, and educators. And let me tell you about just a few, some you may have heard of, and some I am quite sure you have not. In the 1760s, Mary Catherine Goddard and her widowed mother became publishers of the Providence Gazette newspaper and the annual West Almanac, making her the first woman publisher in America. In 1775, Goddard became the first woman postmaster in the country in Baltimore. And in 1777, she became the first printer to offer copies of the Declaration of Independence that included the signers' names. So I guess that makes her the first entrepreneur to sell souvenirs to tourists. <laughs> and you may think you know the first, who the first woman was who ran for president. And no, although some of you might guess that it was Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm in 1972, you would only be partially correct because she ran for a major party. However, some interesting information. In 1872, Victoria Claflin Woodhull ran on the People's Party ticket with Frederick Douglass as her running mate. Now, prior to her foray into politics, she and her sister had run a journal that was considered quite scandalous at the time because it often ran articles about women's suffrage, free love, and socialism. Needless to say, we never had a President Woodhull, but I have no doubt it was a very spirited campaign. Now, I've mentioned that women were also adventurers and explorers. Now, many people are familiar with Amelia Earhart, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. However, have you ever heard of Annie Edson Taylor? No? Well, on October 24, 1901, Annie Edson Taylor, a school teacher from Michigan, became the first person to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. I said she was adventurous. I did not mean to imply I thought she was prudent or sensible. <laughs> or what about Gertrude Ederly, who in 1926 was the first woman to swim across the English Channel? On October 23, 1934, the American adventurer Jeanette Pic Picard set an altitude record for female balloonists when she ascended to 57,000 feet, which is about the equivalent of 10 miles in a balloon. And these women are probably the reason we have people like Sally Ride and Mae Jameson, the astronaut, and so many others. Now, many of the women and the events I've just described occurred well before the Seneca Falls Convention in, 19, in 1848, where women's suffragists led by Elizabeth Cady Staten proposed the right to vote, own property, sign contracts, serve on juries, and receive fair pay as a woman's basic right. Now, while we often focus on the larger women's movement, I think it is equally important to note that before, during, and after the Seneca Falls Convention, women in groups and as individuals fought and made gains in many other areas. Many of those gains came during our country's times of crisis, when gender or race no longer mattered quite as much as the interest of achieving a shared goal. Given the opportunity to make up major contributions to the national war effort, women seized it. And arguably, one of the institutions that's, that led the way and which has also benefited from embracing diversity are our armed forces. The integration of our armed forces was a momentous event in our military and our national history. And it represented a milestone in the development of the armed forces and the fulfillment of what we talk about when we say our, these are our democratic ideals. The existence of an integrated rather than segregated armed forces is an important factor in our military today. The experiences of women of people of color and women in World War I and World War II and some of the post-war pressures generated by the civil rights movement compelled all of the services and the rest of society to re-examine traditional practices of segregation. The order in 1948 that desegregated the military led the way in many ways for changes in other parts of our society. 
And while there are differences in the ways that the services move toward racial and gender integration, all were subject to the same demands, fears, and prejudices, and had the same need to use their resources, though, in a more rational and economical way. And all of them reached basically the same conclusion. Traditional attitudes towards people of color, women, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender populations must give way to democratic concepts of civil rights. Now, if the integration of the armed services now seems inevitable to everyone, it nevertheless faced opposition that had to be overcome and problems that had to be solved through the combined efforts of political and civil rights leaders and civil and military officials. Gender integration was also a boost to the military and the benefits that, it's re that we realize as a result have only blazed a trail for women who want to serve our country in many other ways. And one example that's very near here of that, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly, is the first Women's Army Auxiliary Corps we know as the WAC Training Center opened not far from here at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. And the arrival of those, those first women and their subsequent training brought considerable public interest, and I'll explain why shortly. They arrived there in July 1942. And among this first group were 125 enlisted women and 400 officer candidates, 40 of whom were black. And they'd all been selected to attend this school. They may have lived in segregated quarters, but their training was held in an integrated setting, which was for the first time in any of our military services. Of course, after that, they, they were in segregated units, but they broke barriers when they trained together. If you looked at what those women did during their wartime service, there were certain military and legislative changes that were enacted soon after the conflict ended. For instance, shortly after the war, World War I ended in 1917, during which over 20,000 female army nurses served in hospitals in the United States and overseas, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was passed, giving women the right to vote. Not necessarily saying the two are connected, but certainly women's performance had to have some impact on that. Right now, out of the 2.2 million troops that have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, more than 255,000 have been women. And I believe, and I feel confident in saying so, that in large part because of their performance, the Department of Defense recently lifted its direct ground combat exclusion rule, opening positions previously held solely by men to women. And this will allow and provide for full career opportunities and promotion for them to reach their highest potential. The landmark Supreme Court case that I also think is part of this is called Frontiero versus Richardson. And in that case, it decided that the benefits given to members of the US military cannot be different because of gender. And up until that point, if you were a female in the military and you claimed a male, your spouse, as a dependent, unless you could prove that you provided more than 50% of their support, you were not allowed to receive the same monetary benefits as your male counterparts, who did not have to prove the same. But today, there is complete pay parity and equality for men and women in the military services, which is not something that large, other large organizations, public or private in this country, can make a, as, a, as a claim. Now, all I don't have a lot of life and death examples in the corporate world, the reality in private industry like the military is, the question is, do we want full participation from each teammate in deciding the direction of our change? Embracing a diverse workforce provides a level of comfort to a company's employees, it gives them the, the confidence that they can make recommendations for change. It drives innovation, and it encourages flexibility. Today, the business world is full of examples like Sheryl Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, Indra Nuri of PepsiCo, Denise Morrison of Campbell's Soup, and Renee James of Intel. Now, despite evidence that companies that have women on their boards generate more value to their corporations by broadening market vision, enhancing board dynamics, inspiring female stockholders, and improving corporate reputation, the inclusion of women in the ranks of senior leadership still does not reflect the full value that we bring to the table. Let's also not forget that women oversee 83% of direct consumer spending, own half of all public stock, 
and make up more than 50% of the available talent pool. Women in the private sector are joined by inspiring and talented women in the public sector, like Ovita Culp Hobby, who was appointed by President Eisenhower as the very first Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Or women like former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, Jocelyn Elders, former U.S. Surgeon General, Wendy Davis, Texas State Senator and current candidate for Governor of Texas, Elena Kagan and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justices. And a woman I admire very much is Judge Julie Robinson. As a child, Julie Robinson was inspired by a story told by her grandmother of how civil rights pioneer Mary McLeod Bethune was invited to the White House to meet with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Years later, Julie Robinson followed Bethune's footsteps into the White House to be interviewed for a federal judgeship. She's currently a district judge in Topeka, Kansas, and she began her journey at age five when she decided to become a lawyer. And she credits her success to her father's faith in her and the fact that her mentors set high standards and demanded the best of her. Judge Robinson tells young people, you never can dream big enough. You can never really know all that is in store for you. All you can do is make sure that you are ready and positioned and able and willing to accept all that comes your way. It has been said, and I've never been able to find out conclusively who, may, who said this, that well-behaved women rarely make history. Some of you have heard that one. And I, believe, I personally believe that, that that is completely true. I also, though, believe that your zip code, where you're, whether you're from a single parent family, or you never had anyone in your family from, graduate from college really matters. I don't think any of that is determinative of your future. What really matters is what's in your heart, you know what you're passionate about, you know what you care about, and you know where you have the greatest skills and you apply those skills. Now in 1957, there would have been plenty of believers if you'd made the following prediction, that a little African-American girl born in a small town in Wisconsin, who then moved to a slightly larger impoverished city in the shadow of St. Louis called East St. Louis, Illinois, who was raised by a single mother who herself was held back from going to first grade, yes, I flunked, for, I flunked kindergarten, um, would be able to be successful. Um, and that maybe her story would simply end with her graduating from high school, maybe finding some kind of a small job and raising a family. Well, I had the fortune of having people who believed in me, who maybe themselves had never graduated from college, um, didn't understand what that was all about, but they encouraged me to go and they supported me in every way they could think of, even if it was $5 here and there, if it was a phone call to encourage me when I was down. They just said, you know, just keep on pushing, you can do this. And, and they just had faith in me. In my time in the military, I've learned a lot of things like history and tactics and strategy, but I also was taught about how to have a plan for my life, how to overcome obstacles and fears, how to work successfully with all kinds of people, to overcome and exceed the assumptions and expectations of people who didn't really know me. And also that when you stand up for yourself, you're also standing up for other people. And also that just because you have a title, a fancy title, people don't have to follow you. You have to earn their trust each and every day. So here are some thoughts that I want to share on leadership about the extremely diverse world we live in. And I hope that the next leaders We'll maybe take one or two of these, and, and maybe they'll be useful. First, and this is certainly not an original thought on my part, because I have to give credit to Colin Powell and many others for thinking of it, but people always know when you're faking it. A good leader knows their people and makes a conscious and sincere effort to do so. However, if you're just going through the motions or doing it because you read it somewhere or someone like me suggested it, Trust me, you will be fooling nobody but yourself. Genuine caring and concern will always, always, always motivate more than fear or bullying. Second, you have to have the courage to constantly examine your team, your club, your group, or your organization and remove those people who are underperforming. The good people, the committed people, know exactly who the underperforming ones are. 
they are actually waiting for the leader to do something about them. And this is not just true for a large bureaucracy, it's also true for a sorority, a fraternity, a church group, large or small businesses. Because when you do not take action, the good people begin to slack off because they know that they're the only ones who are doing the work. So ultimately, the team is, no, is not going to be effective as it could be. Trust me. So if you do it successfully, the others will be happier. And don't merely reorganize around a weaker, underperforming person. After you have attempted to teach, coach, and mentor, okay, acknowledge defeat, replace them, and move on. The other people will work all the harder for you. Third, always remember that no matter what the job, you are there to serve. Doesn't matter if you're in the military, the business, or some other branch of government. Commit to serving selflessly, not selfishly. And that's important. I want to say that again. Commit to serving selflessly, not selfishly. Because it is never about you. And the moment you believe that it's about you, you sacrifice making that organization the best it can be. Fourth, your job as a leader is to take care of those who follow you. And by that, I make, mean to make sure they are all pulling in the same direction and make sure there are people who follow you who are prepared to do well. Now, there's a story I want to relate about President Lincoln, I think, that truly illustrates this point. During the worst days of the Civil War, he would often head outside the city to a telegraph office to escape the summer heat and also to get the first reports from the battlefields. On one particular occasion, a message came in describing yet another Union Army disaster. Confederate cavalry had surprised a Union camp near Manassas, Virginia, and captured a Brigadier General and 100 horses. That may sound funny to us these days, but horses were pretty valuable back then. And he was pretty dejected as he received that news and reportedly said, sure hate to lose those 100 horses. Now, the telegraph operator wanted to make sure he understood, so he, had, he felt like he had to ask him, Mr. President, what about the Brigadier General? And Lincoln is said to have replied, I can make a Brigadier General in five minutes, but it is not easy to replace 100 horses. <laughs> so the lesson that that for, for me, relates to me is whether it's true or not, I think this is worth remembering, is that leaders are not the most important person on the team. Fifth. There are no minor, trivial, or unimportant jobs in any successful organization. The problem is when you have leaders who don't understand or appreciate that point. Sixth, to learn to recognize opportunities where other people only see danger, chaos, and confusion. The leader, you need to recognize there's opportunity there, capitalize on that, and exploit those opportunities. Seventh, and, and the final, and perhaps I think the most important point, it is not necessarily who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you. And I got this quote from the 2005 movie, Batman Begins. And I think it's bear, it bears repeating. It is not necessarily who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you. And I like it because I think it is concise and simple and it says what I think is the most important thing about being a leader. Your actions speak much louder than your degrees, who you know, or anything else. It is what you do with what you have been given that really counts. So in closing, if I can sum up the seven principles that I live by, would go something like this. If we are all going to succeed, we cannot exclude or treat anyone as less than a valued member of the team. It's our responsibility to set the bar high for ourselves and others. We need to dream great dreams, put on overalls, leverage all of our diverse talents, and ultimately just go out and set the world on fire. And then, and then, you have to know when to step aside, when to let the people you have coached, mentored, and taught take over and then let them lead. In closing, as we honor the many women who have shaped our history, let us also celebrate those who make progress in our current time. Let us remember that when women succeed, 
America succeeds. And from Wall Street to Main Street, in the White House and on Capitol Hill, let us put our nation on the path to success. The distinguished men and women, these leaders, we honor this evening have helped us to do just that. So your charge, and mine, is to carry on the work of the women who came before us and ensure that our daughters have no limits on their dreams, no obstacles to their achievements, and no remaining ceilings to shatter. I know we can do it because we must. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, it is working. Okay. <laughs> um, so you talk a lot about needing to be a leader, someone who can guide your people and ensure that everyone is feeling or just re remaining a constant inspiration to people. But what also, um, because that can be something that's very draining. So what do you do more for self-care to ensure that you don't burn out and that you, the people um, that follow you don't burn out as well? Okay, you have to set aside time for me time, for personal time, and, and kind of be selfish about it. Schedule it. Make a date with yourself. If that's just exercise, if it's getting a massage, I mean, because stress can, you know, stress can affect us in many, many ways. Um, and, and then do the same thing and encourage the people that work for you to do the same thing. Sometimes you need to leave the office because what will happen is your staff will, in some cases, stay as long as you're there because they think you expect to see them. So I, I consistently will remind myself to leave, even in the Pentagon, because um, I could work late, because I've you know, got things to do. But I'll look up and I'll realize they're still there, so I'll just walk out. And sometimes if I know they've got an anniversary or a birthday, I'll say, what are you still doing here? You should have gone home an hour ago, and I'll kick them out. Because so you sometimes have to take care of them and let them, again, let them know you care about them. Oh, my name's Adrian. Um, being in the military, I know there's been significant um, changes for women um, that have given them more equality. Um, are there any other aspects that you, that you feel sh um, should continue to change to give women in the military more um, equality? Um. A number of things. I, I think I would like to see, and this may be counterintuitive, I would like to see more women get into the military. Right now, the numbers for the active duty military are around 15%. For my organization, the Army Reserve, we've got about 23%, so we've got the highest percentage. But, you know, I'm a person who believes in critical mass, and you have to reach critical mass in many cases before you begin to make progress. And so, you know, it's harder to, de to deny that you have qualified people when you have a lot of people. It's easier to make the argument when you don't have that many competing. So I think it's important. And I also think that, you know, it's hard to change an organization from outside the organization. So even though I could have left, you know, when I hit my 20-year mark, I'm now over 35 years, I thought it was important to stay because I thought it was important to continue to try to shatter the glass ceilings as I made my way up, because I wanted to open the doors for other people. So I, I truly think that now is a great time because we have opened up so many other opportunities. And like any other organization, for example, in the private sector, a lot of people who, would, who rise to the rank of CEO in corporations come from the marketing side of the house. They don't come from the HR side of the house, the human resources side of the house. The same is pretty much true for the military. We've never had a four-star general in the Army, male or female, who came from the human resources side of the house. 
They typically come from what I would call the operational side of the military, which is like the operational side of corporations. So I think it's important for more people to get into the organization and advance through the ranks. Um, how do you think that Creighton has helped you shape who you are today? Um, some of you may know that I have an uncle who's a Jesuit, and at, at one point when I, when I came to Creighton, he was artist in residence. Um, and then so I had a lot of uh, his, his um, uh, fellow priests who'd gone through seminary with him, who'd all known me since I was really little. Father Schlegel knew me when I was a little girl. <laughs> so um, I think, one, having that kind of a... a an extended family, if you will, when I came here was very helpful. And then just the environment at Creighton. It encouraged, just like my all-girls high school had that I graduated from in St. Louis, it encouraged you to explore. It encouraged you to, to be assertive. Uh, you know, the faculty was very supportive and wanted you to experience things and, and be open to new experiences. And I just thought it was a very learning and supportive and nurturing environment. So it was... It was, a, it was a really good experience. And I've, you know, I'm always telling people I'm a Blue Jay, and they said, what's that, where is it? It's in a state west of Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, was, it, was really, it was really a good experience to be here. And so that's kind of what shaped me. I was just wondering, being where you are, did you have a lot of black or competition with men because some of them think that you know they're supposed to be superior they are the ones that to be looked up to and to have a woman over them some of them they just can't handle it that happened to me in the legal profession and it happened to me in the military um but you know my solution to that was always run faster jump higher be smarter and just you know leave them in my dust uh, but just, just really to do the very best that I could and to demonstrate that I was a team player and that my ultimate goal was for the team to succeed. It wasn't about me, as I said earlier. And some people I won, I won over that way because they saw I demonstrated that I wasn't looking for any kind of special favors. I don't know why they would think that, but they did. And I just dissuaded them of that notion. And then we began to get to know each other as people and teammates and not as a woman and a man. And that has made all the difference. And some of those very same people who were skeptical when they met me are still my lifelong friends. And I'm still in touch with some of them who have retired. And some of them embraced me and became my mentors. So it, you know, I'm a firm believer that hard work will win out. And yes, you may run into people who are gonna try to pose obstacles, but as I said, that can happen in any organization. You just simply have to figure out ways to either win them over or run them over. I think there's um, some, there are sayings about creating your own luck through hard work. Um, sometimes though, it may feel like no matter how hard you're working, that luck isn't being created. Um, what are your thoughts on the whole uh, lean in theory as for women being aggressive? And not just women, there are men here in the audience as well. So how do you create your own luck other than hard work, which is a given? Something I sh I've shared with a, a lot of young people is um, I love to read. I love to read biographies and history especially. And I would look for biographies of people who appeared to be successful, who had the same backgrounds or, or interests that I did. And I would just kind of study how they did it, what they did. Um, and I, you know, I learned a lot and, and learned a lot of different tips and tricks and things that I've you know, since used myself. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. And I've actually given that advice to some people that I've mentored in the military, because all the general officers' bios are public record. They're, they're published on a website. And so I'd meet some young soldier who would say to me, I want to be a blank. I'd say, well, this particular general has this specialty. 
why don't you go look at their bio and see the kinds of assignments and jobs they had, the kind of education they got, and use that kind of as a guide. So the same holds true for the private sector. Take a look at what those individuals have done. And you know you can't adopt everything because we're all different. But you're always going to find some nugget of truth or some piece of information that will be useful. Keep asking questions tonight. Um, in the in sciences, in the business world, and I imagine in the legal and the military as well, um, there can be concerns for women. I'm speaking mostly from my women in science course that I took, but there can be concerns by women that they were only reached the point of success, only maybe got into a certain school because they were women, or maybe because they were people of color, or both. Um, how do you kind of deal with those thoughts, is that a concern that you've ever had? What do you have to say to that in general, I suppose, is the question. <laughs> have run into that. Um, and, you know, those, those kinds of folks have already formed an opinion of you before they even met you. So you don't need to bang your head against a wall. Again, I, your, your performance will, will make those individuals, you know, will prove them wrong, basically. And um, so I simply made sure that I performed and outperformed in many cases. And there are people who recognize that you're working hard. It may not always be apparent. They may not come up to you and, and give you an a girl or an a boy. But there are people out there who recognize quality when they see it. And they, just like they will recognize individuals who are more interested in their next job as opposed to the one that they currently have and are not really care to, don't care about the success of the organization so much as their own personal success. So I guess I have a lot of faith in that. It may be naive to some people to feel that way. And I actually, when I was promoted to this particular rank, um, um, this senior officer who, was, who I reported to at the time brought me to his office and he told me, don't ever let anyone tell you that this was given to you. He said, because I know from your record and your reputation that you worked hard, you earned it, you deserve it. Hi, I'm Margaret Zimmer. I work in the Student Activities Office. But my question is, I know um, this generation of women isn't necessarily a group of women who are marching in the streets uh, with picket signs and those kinds of things. What suggestions do you have for this younger generation of women on how to keep fighting for equal rights and those kinds of things, even though maybe that's not necessarily the era we come from. I think it's important to be engaged in, in, um, on, a, on a number of levels. Um, obviously to, you know, as you pursue your professional careers, um, to be engaged in professional organizations. Um, you know, it's, I think it's still too rare that women lead professional organizations. A good friend of mine was one of the first women to be the state bar president of the state of Wisconsin. Um, and since then, other people have followed her. I think we need to reach out for those kinds of opportunities. I think it's important for women to be engaged in, in politics. Um, it may not be, a, you know, it's kind of a messy business, but I think it's important because that's where a lot of decisions are made. That's where a lot of laws are promulgated. And while we may vote those individuals into office, ultimately they're going to then go in and, and, and as I say, pass laws and, and regulations and legislation. But I, I think we need to have a greater voice there. I wouldn't personally do it, but I certainly admire people who, who do. And I think we have to have a, a greater role in, in policy making. Because again, those kinds of things affect us on a personal and local level, um, more so than on a national level. And so I think we, we need to be engaged in those. I, I don't necessarily think um, this generation is not engaged. I think it's just less obvious, as you point out. You're not marching in the streets, but you're, you're up on social media. You're making your opinions, and, and, you're, and you're, you're, you're being heard. But I, I think we need to start thinking, I said, taking it to the next level uh, from professional organizations, which can influ influence policymakers, to actually being the policymakers. What advice do you have for the men in the audience, the men that are important in our lives, the grandson that is the best grandson ever? How do we, what do we teach our men about how to empower and support women? Um, you know, that's a tough one because I'm, 
I'm, see, I'm married. My husband, you know, is, is not a general. So we've, we've had lots of discussions about this and, you know, worked through some, you know, some, some sticky situations. I think it's just about communicating. That, and it's a two-way street. It's not just the men need to communicate with us. We need to communicate with the men in our lives and, and be honest about our um, goals and aspirations and then have a talk as a team about how we're going to get there. Because sometimes there'll have to be a trade-off. You may want to go follow your dreams and, and, and a, your company offers you a job halfway around the world. Well, that's a discussion you need to have with your spouse because it may be five years later, it's going to be his turn. In fact, that's what a lot of people I know have done is, okay, this, we're going to try to work this out, but you know, you're going to get your opportunity and I'm going to get my opportunity. Or if you have an honest conversation and say, which one of us really has the greatest chance of, of going the furthest? And then you make the necessary accommodations. But um, it's, it's, you know, then those are not easy conversations because we're all usually, you know, strong-willed and, and intelligent people. But it's, a, it's, it's important to have those conversations. And they don't always go well. Sometimes my husband and I agree to disagree, but, but at the end of the day, we've, we've talked about it and we've communicated. Hi. <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm from Pakistan, and I can share with you, uh, women, they have to get this freedom for themselves. No men are ready to give that. So. But uh, my question is, uh, if you look at how we look after our careers, there's a very crucial time between 25 years to 35 years, where we actually set a pathway for our future life to go and which way our career is going to be there. But that is the time when to have a family. And a lot of women are opting really to have family after 35. There are pros and cons to that. Uh, what is your take on it? Because uh, obviously as a society we need this unit, family as a unit to stay on and kids are a very important part of it. But then how far we can delay or how early we can do it, what's the solution, if any? I, I think that's an individual choice and decision. Um, you know, and, and, and everybody reaches it at a different point. Uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of adoption personally because I think there are lots of kids out there who need good families. So if your personal career choices don't allow you to, to have your own children, well, there's lots of kids out there that would benefit from, you know, a, a loving, nurturing family that they don't currently have homes. So, you know, I think we can, you know, perhaps have to look at a hybrid perhaps in terms of a family unit, but I, I think there are opportunities out there that exist for that to happen. First of all, thank you so much for coming back and sharing your wisdom and life story with us. It's, it's very inspiring, frankly. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you're probably the highest ranking Creighton graduate in terms of military experience. You have a powerful story to tell. You're obviously a proven leader. How do you, what are your, what are your thoughts about sharing and engaging a larger audience and helping to inspire young folk, especially women of color who don't see a lot of people like you and realize the struggles that you have overcome and your appreciation for history and your appreciation for inclusiveness and just the leadership that you've, uh, that you've talked about. What are your plans about going forward, about spreading the word, so to speak? Ask me what I'm gonna do after I retire, huh? <laughs> um, one of the things I do, I do like public speaking, and then I'll, I'll tell you, you know, when I was younger and I had to do my first speech class here at Creighton the night before, it was just those, a little five-minute speech you have to do for your speech class. I didn't sleep. 
I thought I was going to die, <laughs> quite frankly. It was, it was horrible. I just wanted it to be over. But since then, obviously, the, you know, the military has kind of compelled me to start learning how to, to be a better public speaker and to do these kinds of things. And I've discovered I like to do it. What I would like to do at, at some point when I you know, retire from my civilian job and retire from the military is work a lot with small community-based organizations. You know, a lot of people you know, you are signed up for speakers bureaus like you know, Colin Powell and, and, and Hillary Rodham Clinton, but they command six-figure you know, speaking fees. But I want to reach out to is organizations that you know, are, are at, let's say, small and community-based and can only afford a small fee because I think it's important for them to have access and, and the ability to work with people who've had some of the experiences that I've had, and in turn to work with youth organizations and, and talk to them, because that's really my love is, is working with, with young people. So, um, and my husband's gonna watch this and say, you never told me that. <laughs> so you made me, you made me disclose my plans earlier than I might have, but, but it, it, is, um, it is important to me to do that, and I wish more people would do that, because I'll be, you know, quite frankly, I've been frugal and I've taken care of my, my, my retirement, um, uh, you know, planning so I can do that and not have to rely on that for income because I, I do want to do that. And I've been with a lot of those small community-based organizations and tried to get speakers to come in and conduct a workshop or, or, or to, you know, on leadership or organization management and things like that, and you can't afford them. So I, I'm going to try to price myself in a way that will allow people either for free or, you know, for a small um, um, you know, honorarium, so I can reach as many people as possible and offer them that service. What made you decide that you wanted to go into the military, like coming to Creighton? Like, I, I'm a Creighton grad too. And so, um, I mean, what, what made you decide that this would be your, your field, your major or whatever? Okay, this is a true story. Um, for those seasoned members of the audience who remember that college registration involves standing in a hot, smelly gym and standing in line and hoping that you would get to class you wanted to sign up for, um, we didn't have computers. And I was working my way through school. I had work study. I worked over here at the hospital in the emergency room on weekends. And I had night, a night job. And, but I needed a science credit to complete that requirement. I really wanted to take astronomy because I still, I, you know, I thought it would be interesting and cool but I, I couldn't do it at night. So I was standing there looking around and there was one table that had no line. It was a military science line, <laughs> department line. They are the reserve officer training corps. And so I went over, I didn't know what it was. I had no clue. And I just asked the gentleman some questions and he had some cool pictures of people parachuting out of airplanes. And I thought hiking through the woods was not what they were doing. Um, and it was a science credit. And it also offered, uh, at that time, that was a lot of money in 1977, it was $100 a month, which was a car payment for my little stripped down Toyota Corolla that got me to my part-time jobs. And so I said, this is a win-win all the way around. So that's how I ended up in the military science department in the Reserve Officer Training Corps and ended up getting commissioned as an officer. But once I got into it, you know, as I said, I discovered that they spent a lot of time teaching you all kinds of skills. In, in terms of leadership, a lot of the theory, but also the practical exercises that they made us do, because we had to, in that organization, learn how to do leadership type things. Uh, it helped me be a planner, because I was really kind of a procrastinator, and things just kind of, I was more of those, let, let it happen, it'll just happen, it'll be okay. So I learned how to be a better planner. They gave me a lot of career advice. They also, as I said, forced me to do things that I wouldn't ordinarily have made myself do, which was to give a longer than five minute presentation and, and not think I was gonna melt on the spot. And it, it just kind of challenged me to, to work with different types of people and exposed me to a lot of different things. And in the time I've been in the military, I've had the opportunity to travel in the Middle East and you know, in Europe and in the continent of Africa. Spent several days in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is a very interesting place where women, as you know, don't, don't have the right to vote. 
cannot drive cars. And in most public built, you know, in any public building I was in while I was there, there were no women's bathrooms because women don't work. And so they're not expected to go into those buildings. Um, had a chance to go in, into Ethiopia, which is another country that is, you know, wants very much to, to be westernized and is also very uh, emphatic about everybody getting an education. And, and so I've had some really good experiences and, and got a chance to talk with people and experience things. And, and so, you know, as I say, it just started one day back in 1977 in the, in the old gym here at, at Creighton on a hot August day trying to register for classes. And it, it was one of the best decisions that I, that I ever made. I would not, I wouldn't change a thing of it, even the, the good or the bad, because you learn from even your bad experiences. You learn from your failures. And so it's all been, it's all been very good. So it, it all worked out. Thank you so much, Major General Anderson, for your inspirational words. I think I've just, I think we're just thrilled the fact that you're able to come here. This has been many months on the planning, and so thank you so much for coming to Creighton and sharing with us not only your life, but your time. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and have a great evening. <laughs>